Mm-hmm. Hmm. Okay. Ah, ah, ah. Continue. Ah. Good. Here we are. So nice to meet you. To start off with, would you like to say your name and where you are? Yes. Uh, Yaro Starak, uh, currently living <clears throat> in Australia, mm -hmm. Brisbane. Okay. And the first question is, who are you as a person, as, as a human being? And that could be any aspects about yourself that you would like to share, <laughs> qualities, That's, passions, whatever you'd like. Yeah, that, uh, that uh, just reminds me of an exercise in Gestalt training. <clears throat> we used to face one-to-one -one and sit on the floor and say, who are you? And then you're supposed to answer. And then the person says, yeah, but who are you? Well, I'm so-and-so, but yeah, but who are you? And who are you? And that would take maybe 10 minutes. It would be mm -hmm. so frustrating that you would get emotional. So yeah, he, I'm, <laughs> so I can I, say- I, who, I usually only ask it once, so. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that was good exercise because it mm -hmm. pressures you to really stop the role playing, the titles, the, the, um, the stuff you think about yourself. It stops you completely, but it comes to your, to your what I call the soul part of you. Mm -hmm and the soul part. So I'm uh, very much body, mind, and soul, integrated, mm -hmm. uh, dancing like the universe. So that mm -hmm. would be my, my answer. Hmm. Okay, maybe I will ask again. <laughs> All right. And who else are you? Well, I'm a, I'm a male. Again, mm -hmm. I can have a role of a, a male, a therapist, uh, um, private practice, teacher, 30 years of teaching, um, traveler. Mm -hmm. uh, my journeys went around the world. I, I had a very fortunate job here in University of Queensland, thank goodness, that every three years I had a paid six months educational leave, study leave, where I could go around the world. Mm -hmm. So I did, I did. Since I had people in Mexico and Spain and Canada United States, uh, you name it. So I, I did go. So I'm a great traveler and I enjoyed very much the traveling um, around the world. So I'm also a learner. Curiosity is my basic um, interest in being curious. Sometimes I'm curious to a point that I, I get in trouble, but um, one of the things in Gestalt, when you are in trouble, it means you're learning something that you have never learned before. So <laughs> getting in trouble, is a good thing. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So what would you say are some of your values, some of the core values that you orient yourself around? Well, yeah, this, I can think about core values that I have learned from childhood. Uh, my father died in the Second World War. My mother was look after me for, you know, immigrating from Ukraine, uh, ending up in refugee camps, uh, and then landing in Venezuela, where I went to school eight or nine years, back in Canada. Um, so uh, at each stage, the culture, core values were different. So um, it's fascinating. So there are, no, I mean, each culture, each place that you grew up in particularly has their own core values. And, but I, I would say as a therapist, social worker, psychologist, core values is justice, social uh, equality, belief in the possibility of every human being has answers to their difficulties. Uh, and therapists don't know everything or don't know at all. The therapist is there to enable that person to discover what they have already, the answer of their life and their growth. And they get stuck. So if they stuck, but they go to a therapist or to help a friend, and hopefully they get unstuck to carry on living. And that to me, the core value, how, to, how can uh, I as a human being um, live those values and uh, growth, if I'm not growing, from some of the values, I don't bother with them. Mm -hmm. Even though they're ideal, wonderful, uh, I'm not interested. So my core values, I would say, are changing almost uh, every year, I suppose. <laughs> but the basic ones stay, you know, the, the, the human being, 
what is a human being, how we relate to that human being, how we grow together in relationships. I tell to my wife, if I'm not learning from you and not learning from me every day, what's the point? What's the point making having an arrangement, you know? So we seek that value that we have that we can then grow together because as I as a therapist, I know that I have things that can offer the other and they have things can offer me. So we both, even therapy and relationship, we are growing. When you stop growing, that's it. I remember Fritz Perls would say to a client who would uh, not change much and he would bother, he would get bored with him. It was a guy, he would say, get away from me. You bother me, I'm falling asleep. That was in, uh, I was horrified <laughs> because the core values were against what I believed in. But that, I realized that was his strategy to make people connect with their own awareness. So he would get, a, he would say, he would get a call a week later and said, Dr. Pearls, I was so angry at you. I was so pissed off that I changed. I changed what I had to, had to do. I did it without you. So Fritz said, well, then pay me back the money I gave back to you. <laughs> <laughs> so I did that once to one client, particularly mm -hmm. when I work with men, uh, it's, a, it's a tougher situation because they need answers right away. They pay you a hundred bucks and they, they want an answer. And I said, no, I'm not working that way. I'm sorry. You're more on the no, product than sorry. on a process. I'm not even sorry. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's right. I'm not, so I don't work that way. That's it. Okay. And yeah. So it's a strategy, you know, uh, and um, I believe that one of the core values is the truth. Uh, if you stay with your own truth and, and um, communicate that truth clearly to the other, then there is change and growth. If not, it's bullshit. That's all it is. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> so I, you've, you've touched on this a little bit, but I'm wondering mm. if, if a particular event or a piece of those circumstances of your life, um, uh -huh. you would say have really shaped or defined you somehow. Well, yes, of course. Um, the biggest event, of course, is World War II, and I was a baby. <laughs> And we grew up in, uh, in uh, four years in refugee camps in the United States, part of Europe, Germany, Munich. And uh, I later, 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 very much later when I was working on my own stuff with, in the Gestalt training, I, I questioned myself, what am I doing working with people? I'm not particularly, you know, you know now I know. But before I said, what am I doing so committed to people, saving lives, helping? My first job in Canada after I finished my master's was a mental hospital. And I said, what am I doing in the mental hospital? I'm 24 year old, I don't know anything. And I'm alone with a supervisor. We, we just talk to each other and support each other. We don't know anything. There were no drugs at that time. There were patients living for 10, 20 years in the hospital, look, looked after you know, with doctors and stuff. And then I, I had a big painting, I used to do painting, uh, like abstract, I was very, you know, uh, curious about my uh, artistic side because my father was a photographer and artist. And my, uh, George Rosner was a teacher, uh, um, uh, learned with Fritz Perls, he was graduated from Fritz Perls there in Esalen. He said, this is your, you spend the three years in a hospital, mental hospital, this is your art therapy. I said, what? <gasps> and then it hit me. There were black, red, and uh, ugly colors, in, in, like rays of, of, of striking. And I just got out of this realization. I am helping people because I wanted, as a growing up person, save the world, no matter what. And started in this, the fortune I started with a government job in the mental hospital for three years. And then, of course, after, and I said, well, what am I doing? I'm not saving anybody here. <laughs> so, so my trick is, and my strategy is when I don't know, don't know what to do, I go further learning. So I went from Vancouver to Toronto for my PhD. Uh, and that didn't work much. 
So I went and suddenly Toronto had an institute in 70, 71 or so. And I jumped in there and George Rosner was a, was a shaman man and theater man and worked with Fritz for five years, good friend of Fritz. And he began to start the three-year program. And the moment I finished the three-year program, he said, join me as a staff member. So I was four years a staff member there. But still I was there teaching, helping, enabling. It was fun, it was great. And uh, I said, that is not something uh, that could get, <laughs> I, go, I go nowhere with that personally. Hmm. Um, so I, I found a, a newspaper place, University of Queensland is looking for a job. I said, I can do that job, no problem. So I, I said, send them a telegram. There were no internet then. Probably there are plenty of applic applicants. Don't forget it. I'm going to. Well, in the two weeks, I get a telegram. You're starting July 78. You're starting the job. University of Queen, Australia. I said, I don't even know where Australia is. <laughs> <laughs> so fortunately, my uh, psychiatrist friend who studied with me in Toronto moved to Melbourne. So I, I rang him and said, um, what I mean, I'm supposed to be in Brisbane in, 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 in July. What am I supposed to do? He said, don't bring any electrical items because electricity is different here, 240 versus 110. Mm -hmm. But you can bring whatever you want to. It's, Brisbane is a wonderful place. Send me a map. It's a good place. It's a bit of a village, you know, in that time. And the university is very well known. It's a good one. So, okay. I left, I left, and I wanted to get out of Canada for the cold. Uh, I understand you. I went, and this is why I said to you, I went to Mexico every December for holidays mm -hmm. <laughs> to, uh, what, what the, that's uh, the famous, uh, what was the famous uh, play, La Quebrada, um, don't, where they jump from, the kids jump from In Acapulco. high. Acapulco, Acapulco mm -hmm. famous Acapulco, was very famous. Mm -hmm. So we went there uh, almost every year to warm up. And I realized I really prefer, because of being in Venezuela for eight or nine years, I prefer the heat. I love, it. we are here in a se semi-tropical environment, 32 degrees today. Mm. And uh, I love it. People complain, I say, I love it. I love it here. Wonderful. So but my son, from other, yeah, my son from another marriage uh, uh, is in Canada, in Montreal. He born here, raised here, studied here at the university, my university. He said, Dad, I, uh, it's too hot for me. I'm moving. I <laughs> saw so he went to, to Montreal. Yeah. <laughs> so here we are. Here's the, okay. the mixture, the, the, the exchange. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I am also curious. Um, yeah. sometimes, I mean, people have different parts of themselves that they prefer to identify with or not. So I'm wondering how you experience and understand yourself in gender terms or as a man or in your masculinity. Oh, that's a good one. Because you know what? Frankly, uh, being raised with a mother, single boy, with a mother um, in Canada, she had a, uh, my aunt, she, she was a twin. So we had, my aunt was a twin and my mother was, we were together in, in Canada pretty well. She never met my, remarried, my mother. And so when I came to Australia, uh, I was uh, looking for the, an identity. Who am I? I have, look, I have 40, 50 students, they're all female, but one or two guys, you know and psychology, social work, social science, all. I said, I can get along well with women. I, I had groups, women groups in Gestalt. I felt very comfortable being with women. I said, what, who am I as a man? So a friend of mine from Sydney said, you want to do a workshop? You work with groups? Yeah, sure. Let's get a man group together. I said, sure. Okay. How, how many? I said, uh, 10 or 12 would be ideal, okay? He rang me in Brisbane and said, look, I have a place in the mountains and I have um, about 20 men. Would you, how, what do you think? I said, that's fine. 20 is good. Next day he rings, how about 50? I said, bring them all in, bring them all in. <laughs> so we have 55 men sitting in a big circle on the rock. 
uh, each one had a rock. And I said, what am I supposed to do now? I know groups, but I work with mostly with women. These are all these guys looking at me, young, old. Fortunately, before I left for that um, event, uh, this is my kind of, I, I don't know, spiritual luck. A book came to my, in my hands. It's called the, the, um, the Archetypes of Male Initiation. I go, ooh, that sounds interesting. So I read the book immediately. What can I do? Ideas from, and, uh, and I learned about archetypes, male archetypes, uh, the warrior, the lover, the um, trickster, all kinds. So I had these four or five archetypes. And when I went there, I said, okay, guys, we sit around on a big stone. Everybody had a stone, 50 stones. And now I'll give you the four archetypes. The lovers are younger. They have issues with women. They have not married, probably. They're really in, in love or out of love. They have issues. The warriors are the ones who love army, uh, like to explore things, explore. The, the, um, the uh, tricksters are usually older men who know life and can really trick you into stuff. And uh, lo, lo, uh, let's see, four. The fourth one was, um, anyway, escape me. Sometimes a Warrior. wizard or a... No, the, that's the trickster. The wizard okay. is trickster. Uh, lover warrior, trickster, and uh, something else. Anyway, you'll come to me. <laughs> anyway, four archetypes. There are many archetypes, but there's the four archetypes. And so I said, okay, lovers on this side, trickster on that side, um, warriors on that side, and the, um, what else? Um, the other guys. <laughs> the other guy, the other guys, this side, they'll come. And, and they went and I saw, okay, fun. Next step done. What's the next step? So I went around to these little subgroups uh, and uh, I went to the warriors. They were, got undressed, you know, start jumping and got a stick and they were all who, 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 and the, and the, you know, doing the tribal stuff. I went to the lovers. Oh, the guys are crying, tell their stories, how bad the things are. They, they were, Divorce, marriage, uh, lovers gone, all kind of feelings came up, you know. And the um, the uh, tricksters, the, the the shamans, tricksters would stand up, and one guy would stand a big rock and say, "Boys, I know my, I lived fifty years, I know how life is all about. I'll tell you what to do." Ah, and, and one is Joe the Jokers. The jokers, I think they want to archetype of funny. Everything is funny, positive. And there's no trouble. Everything is fine. So we had these four, four groups. And I said, what? Okay, I've done the first step, but we have two days of this work. So then I got into the idea of drama therapy, where each group had to design a scene in their life. And, the, and those guys who were part of that group would identify them. So for example, I, I have a problem with my parents, two or three sisters. And um, okay, you, there would be two guys be a parents and then another one a sister, et etc. Cetera, et cetera. And they would enact the scene that they would give them about the issue or problem they had with their family or their relationship or at work anywhere at all. And they would enact those scenes. And of course, the observers would comment on those scenes. And I was just fascinated how, by not being therapizing, not being uh, the, the uh, therapist helper, just, and the other one, tell stories. So I said, tell the story of you. And when men start telling stories, particularly when you're surrounded by men who, the rule was no, no criticism, no judging, just listen. So a man would stand up in the middle of the group and would tell his story, his life story, and man, just broke up. People crying, people uh, sharing, people, uh, I know, hugging each other. So we had a two days of marvelous time together. And I'm, here I am observing and say, whoa, okay, no, that's, 
That's what a man is all about. Not just, you know, the ego macho style, style that we are, the society is projecting on many men, the drunk idiot. But there are a lot of human um, sensitivities in a man. But sensible, sensitive old a young man was considered a negative. You know, you're just a swap or swap sensitive young man. Mm -hmm. And then I realized that this is a great thing for me. So I spent 10 years with my friend Rain, 10 years organizing men's groups. And sometimes mm -hmm. we had a men's festival where we had 150 men got in gathering. We got them into drumming. We had a 50 man drumming together mm -hmm. and a hundred men dancing. So, I mean, it was like a incredible, incredible experience for me because I really grew into the idea of being a man. Mm -hmm. uh, and what it means to be a man. Fortunately, I have two boys. Uh, one is 40 and the other one's 12. So <laughs> <laughs> we have real chats together. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, my 12 year old sits to me in, on, the, on the couch and says, okay, dad, now we talk man to man. I said, sure, of course, let's do it. <laughs> so he asked me a question. Now, the recent one is, you were in the Second World War. Oh, well, yeah, I was very young. Well, do uh, you know anything about communists? Yeah, they killed my father. I'm very angry. Oh, I'm very interested in communism. <laughs> not that kind of communism, okay? No, so, not that yeah. kind. He's, the, the, okay. the, 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 the military, the KGB, who are, wow. who are they? The history, he loves history about this stuff, you know? Now, oh. he's, now he's researching Albania. I said, I don't know where the hell Albania is. I don't even know. <laughs> So he's telling me where Albania is, what kind of military they have, you know, that sort of thing. Nice. So, so that, that's there. also part of the being a man, being a father. Absolutely. 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 Relating. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And that's actually another one of my questions. Um, mm -hmm. Getting into the age issue. How are you experiencing age or how do you understand it? Or how are you at this time in your life? Mm. Well, one of the things I find that uh, as, my, as I, was I was growing and still growing, uh, age is only an opinion. Now, the beautiful thing about scientific discovery I made, and you can go online and go on biological age versus chronological age. The chronological age, the time where you were born. Now, the issue is for me that I don't know where, when I was born. I, as, as a matter of fact, I was in Ukraine before COVID. My son has business in Ukraine. He's a kind of an entrepreneur. And I went to the office of statistics and said, I need a copy of my birth certificate. Well, they couldn't find it. The war, ah, the war, you see, they burned a lot of things. The communists came in, took over. So I don't have. So my mother, I have a birth certificate that my mother went in Canada when I needed a Canadian passport, she went to the local priest and said, give us a certificate that this boy was born in 1939. Now, I could have born 1940, 1942, 1930, 1938. I don't know. I could have born any time. So I, I said, oh, okay. I clarified that. I don't care what age was born. It's, it's not, I'm not documented, okay? I went to the biological age and you, and you have a questionnaire about your health, your um, you're not drinking, your, your lifestyle, your, your food, all that stuff, weight. And I'm, I come up with 69. So I'm stuck into that. I'm stuck with that. I'm saying, well, how old are you? you I'm 69. Oh, really? You, you, you look much younger than that. <laughs> <laughs> so that's your story now. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. And how are so, you experiencing it, though? So the experience is very positive mm -hmm. because it gives me versus uh, many men, I, I, we have a meetings uh, of men, we go to the movies, we go to the markets, serving coffee together, five or six guys about my age. And many are, are trouble with uh, depression, relationship issues, children grown up issues, all kind of these things. And we talked about these things. We were, you know, we kind of have a coffee and chat about that. And I find that there's very little positive, um, positive connection that people with themselves. So um, when uh, when when you get yourself 
at the time when you begin to feel, oh my God. And people tell you, family, man, I, and doctors tell me, at your age, you know, you, you, you know, take it easy, sit, uh, watch TV, no, just relax, you know, that's, you, you're retired, you don't have to. Well, I, I'm fortunate, I have a wife that is younger. She keeps me busy. She got me to interview with you. She gets me to go out and do things. Uh, now I'm translating her whole course in uh, art therapy, Gestalt art therapy course that she was running all over South America and Spain. Uh, I'm translating that into English. So that keeps me very busy to translate and read it and put together a course which will go online I hope end of this year in English. She's got everything prepared, everything done. Of course, she, I'm also her assistant in English because she will write an email and say, Yaro, take a look if it's written all right. And I tell you, from 10 years ago that she came in here without a word in, Span in English, only Spanish, because she didn't care about English. In Spain, nobody cares much about English. And now, 10 years later, she is producing things in English. I, I, now, less and less I have to correct. I said, well, your email is perfect. No, I don't have to correct it. Look at it. Ah, but maybe there's a comma. Okay, I'll read it again, see? So I'm in, in constant uh, occupied place where I don't have time to think, oh my God, this age is just terrible. I don't feel good. Life is bad. I also read books on health and healing. Now, I'm reading a book now uh, by a, a doctor, I think it's Gupta, who was actually a medical surgeon of Obama in the White House. And he wrote a book about a clear thinking and clear, clear brain. And he's a brain surgeon. So he's, he look, opens the brain, he looks at it. He wrote a book and he's, he has this 12, 12 directives how to stay healthy and how to maintain your, your brain, your body and brain particularly to prevent Alzheimer's because his family had Alzheimer's. And he says, one of the things you prevent Alzheimer's, he says, don't think that Alzheimer's starts with age. It starts by 40, by 50 already the symptom. But I have evidence, you know, resurging evidence that the brain and the cells regenerate with activity with the, with the, you know, the, the cells don't die. You know, they say, oh, well, brain cells die every day. No, they, they don't. just get bored. <laughs> they just get bloody bored, go to sleep. <laughs> That's how you feel depressed because you go, the brain goes to sleep. <laughs> hmm. So as long as he's got 12 different food, one thing that, you know, listeners may be interested, simple thing, walk half an hour every day to the park. That's why I have a park here. Every day for five days walk, two days rest. It's only half an hour. And he gives you statistics up to 40% of reduction of cancer, Alzheimer's, all kind of stuff. Only, this is only that. No, mm -hmm. of course, alcohol and all that. But that is in itself an example that if you stay alert with yourself and you use your body, the mind will work. Use your mind, the body will work. No, it's, it, that's the way it is. It kind of feels obvious, but you know, a lot of people don't do it. And it's very different to see it in a book than have this conversation with you and see yeah. how active and how much it's working. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's 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 mm -hmm. incredible. The other thing is, I'm also a mystic. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm trying to be <laughs> call myself the mystic, and my mentor in the mysticism and storytelling um, is Michael Mead, who lives in uh, hmm, in Seattle area. And he has these podcasts. He's got now about 250 podcasts and he sends them to me and I, I listen to them. And the current one that I'm writing, a, a, um, he helps me to write a uh, blog called Reflections Yarrow. In that blog, I have every month reflection of my life or my style. And right now I'm writing because of the COVID and the, all the issues in politics and all that crap going on about fear, the fear of fear. And it's his statement of what happens when people are truly, like now with COVID, like in, enter this fear and they know what to do. So what they do, 
they project their stuff onto others. So look at what happened to the state. They attacked the, uh, the center, the, 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 what do you call it? The, the center, capital? The, the capital, mm -hmm. the, the center of government of the United States. They attacked it because they were afraid and they were dressed in guns and stuff. It said that's fear and the fear creates change, it turns into anger. And anger can create a lot of this destruction because you know somebody can stop them, then there's a war. That, and so I'm writing about the idea of fear of fear and how we deal with that and how can we deal with our inner fear more, how we project our inner fear onto the world and what happens. If you collect that fear into more and more people, you know, and all these theories that this is bad, that's bad, they just, you know, uh, explode. So the, the world now is exploding in all kinds of fear. And on the other hand, they say that out of 100 countries, uh, quite a few, about 50% now are led by radical uh, autocrats and psychopaths. I call them psychopaths. They don't give a shit. Look, Trump is a classic psychopath. I mean, his uh, relative, woman, a PhD psychology, wrote a book I just read mm -hmm. about Trump as a danger to humanity. And thank God he left, but at least he's not left yet. I tell not you. gone yet, but yeah. So there's a huge impact about that. Mm -hmm. So having that information, but I don't keep the information. Oh, I read a book and saw a movie, no. I put it out. I make a mm -hmm. project out of it. If somebody can write about against it, that's fine but I'm stimulating myself and the community that read. I have 250 readers mm -hmm. that stimulate their thinking. Okay, I'm happy to do that, you see? Mm -hmm. And I'm from my home. <laughs> I don't have to do anything, just write. And that, that actually kind of fits in with my next question, which is how you understand and experience uh, privilege and power in your life. Privilege and power. Mm -hmm. Well, for me, money is, is power and privilege. You look at the billionaires. You know what, I, I don't know whether you know this, but Facebook just canceled Australia. Defriended de de Australia, because Australia is have passing laws that will require Facebook to pay for authors, for authors. So they what, they, they defriended de Australia. So we had a huge attack on Facebook and the, and the government said, okay, we're gonna to to other platforms, we don't need you. So Facebook started to negotiate. And now as of today, this is a two or three days ago, today, Facebook have made an agreement with the Australian government to continue the Facebook because they'll start paying some authors, which makes sense, you know, makes a lot of sense. And they're billionaires and uh, uh, you know, some are good people like uh, maybe Bill Gates, they, they criticize him, but he, the man is putting billions in, in health. You know, I don't know what he's doing with that. Um, tes te Tesla, Tesla guy who's electric cars, he's developing electric cars where in the future will save the, save the, the atmosphere, the, the, the whole thing and make the economy better. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you have two kinds of uh, psychopaths <laughs> the rich psychopath with money who want to dominate and there are a few of them and the other group, group of saying look i have all these billions what am i going to do let's let's help the world somehow and to me if i were a billion that's what i would do you see i wouldn't help the world as a therapist <laughs> because it doesn't it doesn't go anywhere it's very limited <laughs> impact but i would make a huge impact my, my dream is if I, i'm playing lottery if i had that million dollar my dream is establish art therapy for children near homes of the aged. Hmm. So the homes for the aged, the people in the homes for the aged who sit there, many are capable, go to the, across the street or next door to the children's place, you know, kindergarten, mm -hmm. and to look after the kids and be, be, be busy with the kids and kids are with grandparents, you know. Mm -hmm. We're wonderful, and that's the idea. And I think in Canada they're beginning to do some of that, yeah. where they're inviting grandparents to volunteer to work in kindergarten. But it's not enough. I would actually well, establish. It's also them. set yeah. back with COVID, you know. 
Exactly. They, they, well, that's the problem but, now. But they're, yeah. they're getting vaccinated. So yeah. <laughs> my, my aunt in Toronto, aren't. my yeah. aunt is in Toronto is 90, 97. So and she's just been vaccinated. Mm. <laughs> she's very happy. Yeah. Yeah. She's an artist too. Oh. And, and she says, I like to go out. I like to go to the park. I like to meet mm -hmm. friends. I can't do that. I have to stuck in here. They lock the door on, on me. <laughs> But that's okay, she says, I'm working, I'm painting, I'm painting, I'm making a lot of artwork. Good, good. <laughs> mm. yeah, it's so, that connection, yeah. that loss of connection. Yes, exactly, yeah, yeah. So that is what you would do with your power if you had the privilege of money. That's exactly, and money is power. That's my, my sense. You know, we all have a little bit of power. We can go out and shop. If we mm -hmm. don't have money, we can't get the basic food. So to me, that's somehow the central thing is money in our society. Mm -hmm. I don't know about India and other places, but I find that, and the privileged people are the ones who, um, I guess, accumulate that money for the sake of whatever, I don't know what, but very few really are interested in distributing that money, you know? Mm -hmm. There are a lot of them I know, very rich people in Australia who are not interested in helping anybody. Yeah. So another aspect of privilege is I wonder how you understand yourself and having been in different cultures and different contexts, mm. how do you understand yourself? Do you consider yourself a, a white man? Do you not? How do you understand <laughs> Never, that Never even aspect? thought of that. Now this okay. craziness about America and color and uh, mm -hmm. color stuff. I mean, my son comes home and says, "Dad, we're not allowed to use the N word." I said, "What do you mean? What N word? Negro. It's forbidden. It's canceled. That word is. But that's a word. I said it has nothing to do with race and stuff. There are four or five races: black, white, yellow, uh, and red. At least four races. Okay, basic. These are races." And being a racist is nothing to do with being against some color of skin or, or some culture. Now for me, I'm lucky because I, my education from grade six maybe to grade 10 or grade eight, grade nine in, in Venezuela, it was all, all, all dark kids. They all, we even had songs about the wonderful, uh, Morenas, Morena, mm -hmm. mi, mi niña Morena. <laughs> you know, it's it's a privilege to have that kind of relationship. You know, and beauty in Venezuela. I mean, I mean, there are beautiful women in Venezuela. Some of them earn earn a, a Miss Universe, whatever. You know, several. So, mm -hmm. and there's no question in Colombia. My God, same thing. It's just, and to me, it just it's a no issue at all. No issue at all. I can explain it to my son and etc. and you know teach him that this is you have to be very respectful. And the other thing is that I'm now engaged in the Aboriginal culture. I realize mm -hmm. here I am living 30 years and I don't know anything about Aboriginality. So we, we have now two movies. I got my boys come in, two movies about Aborigine in the 1930s and 40s, how they were killed like animals. Mm -hmm. And they, and I investigated Aboriginal haven't had the right to vote till 1968, and only 1990, one of our prime minister made a sorry time for being so cruel to Aboriginal, it's stealing children. You know, the, the the religious communities had a permission to go to the Aboriginal settlements mm -hmm. and take the kids away and put them in orphanages, mm -hmm. away from the families. And now this, that, that group of people, particularly mothers, are really, really high on the, the volume. Big, the volume is very high on, on saying, what the hell did you do to us? How you eliminate? That's genocide. You know, it's a cultural genocide. It's the same thing in Canada with the residential totally, schools. Totally, totally, totally. Mm -hmm. But here is like a history of, of domination and killing because they were animals. They were the same as kangaroos, you know. And uh, having seen a few of these movies, I said, I said great respect for them. They have 60,000 years of civilization. I say, not, not living. They were the civil, they have laws that you wouldn't believe the laws they have. Correct. The tribe, they have a hundred languages. You know, they, 
and they, they exchanged, there were three millions um, Australians when the English came in, there were not many. So the English declared Australia terra nullis. There's nobody here. We take over because nobody's here. Wait a minute, how about the 60,000 years of Aboriginal life here? Nobody consider that, just business, that's all. The, the, uh, you know, the, the English, uh, I must say the English um, um, empire, like many empires, but particularly uh, long and very good at collecting and ripping off people from other places, Australia, Canada, whatever you go. Uh, they were for years and years ripping off all these countries. That was colonialism. Yeah, that's right. And mm -hmm. fortunately now they are losing it all. That's event, I call it the, I call it the natural justice. No matter what you do and how you do, natural justice will get you sooner or later. It'll get you. And I, I've had many examples of people, very evil, very, very bad people that thought got to get away from things, got it. Yeah, maybe I'll tell you that quickly. Um, a, um, th there's an article I just read. There is a, a, um, a head, a cra cranium, cranium of a, of a bone of a young Aborigine. And the historian was researching that, eventually found that they, that bone was in a museum and his name was scratched on the bone you know, a museum piece. And he mm -hmm. researched that, that, that that boy was killed in a cave in Uluru, which is the most sacred uh, stone of Australia, belonging now, thank God, to Aboriginal tribes. And he was killed by a sheriff who was pursuing him uh, for some crime, 1934. Now, this historian found this sheriff's uh, family here in Brisbane and daughter 80 years old still living and she opened a diary of his guy his her her grandfather I guess yeah father grandfather anyway where he claimed that he shot that Aborigine point blank in the documents official documents in government Australia it said that he shot into the cave because there was a stone thrown at him when he was looking for this boy. So he showed, she shot into the cave. No, he took the guy boy out and shot him outside the cave and put him in the cave to die. So here is an example. And the beautiful reconciliation of that, that the family agreed now to go to Uluru with the families of the Aborigines and bury that skull back into the cave and how beautiful how beautiful that is so to me that's that's a great value yeah there's closure may not be justice but there's closure absolutely that's that's mm -hmm. the and it's natural justice mm -hmm. yeah. Hmm. Yeah, yeah so all of this is is actually very interesting just in the sense of getting to know you and spend some time with you and see how you think mm. and i'm also wondering um you've told me a bit about how you came into gestalt mm. but i'm wondering if we can go a little bit more into that direction <clears throat> and i'd like to know what you found in gestalt that was interesting to you oh yeah wow Ooh, i can go on and on and on <laughs> as i said before already um my strategy of uh, no knowledge development is academia. So when I got stuck in, in the hospital work, I went back and went to university for more studies. Uh, and that guy got, got stuck with the PhD program, which I didn't finish. I, I could have finished, but I didn't. Because the Gestalt training started and I would jump in. Oh yeah, I was doing research on group work because I'm a kind of special in group work. And I went to the university library. There were five or six, you know, the 18, 18, 18 inch films, you know, these little films. Yeah, the eight, of, eight millimeter, right? Or no? mil, sorry, uh, millimeters, millimeters yeah. film. And they were from Esalen, California. These in Fritz mm -hmm. Perls Gestalt Therapy. I go, oh, this is interesting. Okay. So I look at those films. I go, wow. I go just like, you know, when you get someone who said, this is it. This is the answer of my, oh, my, my whatever. And I watched those films several times. And I see this man with a beard, smoking like mad, with five or six or people around him, 
doing miracles. He's got an empty chair in front of him. He called him the hot seat at that time. We call it hot, the hot seat where a person would volunteer to sit and do the, a dialogue with themselves and parts of themselves and stuff happened, not only with the person, but with the group crying and this and that and growth, instant growth. For me, that was a, a magic work. I said, I want to see this guy. I'm, I'm in Toronto, 1971, I'm going. He just died that year. But at the same year, George Rosner, who was working with Fritz Perls, came to Toronto from Chicago. He lived in Chicago. And with a psychiatrist, Harvey Friedman, opened the institute. And I, I, I was in. I was in without asking. There were 60 of us. We had a weekend of selection of 21 or 25, I think 25 people out of 60. So I go, oh my God. But uh, later I found out that they were more interested in kind of academic type people, teachers, uh, PhD professionals. So, so I was one of them and we were 25 people who we had one, one evening uh, a night, three hours, one weekend a, a, a month with different leaders. Like we had people coming from New York, Ishtal Institute. I work with Laura Pearls, I'm very happy to say beautiful work that she did with me about growing up with Laura Pearls, with Z Z um, Zinker and people like that. They all came in because George knew everybody in, in America. And so, and he was also a drama therapist. He ran theaters in Chicago. So we had a lot of dramatic experience, a lot of uh, checks, you know, we want <laughs> checking our awareness. One exercise was to go to the Toronto subway when the subway stops, two of us walk in and start singing happy birthday. Just like happy birthday to you. And everybody, you know, read books, you know, looked at us, you know, and they start singing with us. And subway would stop and we would go out. The doors would close and I would look people back. So we were exploring contact, relationships. We were scared like hell, but boy, it was quite exciting to see uh, the outcome of our risk. That's my book here, where's my Your book? This is, a re this is came, my book came out, Risk in Being Alive. That's the book because I didn't understand um, Pearls, Heffel and Goodman book. It was, oh, I did. It's a lot of book. You got the book? It's a lot of book. <laughs> oh, a lot of book. Well, the advice that George gave all the students is, read one page a week, meditate, think about, it, read again, and then next page if you're clear. I said, no way, the three of us said no. So we got a bunch of students from university because you know we were university people for about two or three months, every evening for three hours. One of us led the group, like the using the exercise of Fritz Perl's book, one took notes and another typed the book. So we finally typed out the whole book. And uh, James, who I said, went to Melbourne because we couldn't get together and agree uh, how to publish it. He went to Melbourne to publish the first ed edition of Risking Being Alive. It's dedicated to George Rosner. This has been a re redone. I, uh, I have now permission to redo it and update it and all that stuff. And it's being being printed again and again because students love it. Because we said, if we understand what we're writing and the exercise we do are useful, then the book is good. If we don't understand, forget it. It's not going to work. So mm. we contributed a bit to the Gestalt world by clarifying, simplifying, uh, opening up the whole Gestalt world. Yeah. Mm. And of course, uh, being in Australia, I came to Australia, opened four institutes. There was Brisbane, we started one with psychiatrists. There was Melbourne, Sydney, uh, Perth. Most of the cities of Australia had a, a Gestalt training group. Uh, we don't have them too many now, about two maybe. And I closed mine. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, was, it was huge. I mean, I would put out an, an announcement, typewritten. I get 30 people to a workshop for, for a Gestalt workshop. Mm. 
So uh, it was quite popular in, in a particular Australia and everywhere else was quite popular. And then, of course, Spain. I went to Spain to do a Gestalt uh, in Valencia, the Valencia Institute, where I met Hema. Uh, I did a few work in Denmark. I went there every July because it's warm um, to do a two week group every July. I was there for 20 years, you know, going to, to work there. So we kind of spread out and developed uh, Gestalt for all over the place. So, in a way, I'm kind of consider the what is it, the um, promoter and uh, guru of Gestalt promotions. <laughs> I'm not a guru in a way of knowing all, mm -hmm. but I, I like to spread the, spread the stuff around as much as possible. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Why? Why? I want, I want the next generation to, um, to get, get the point, you know, because now the people are forgetting. They're looking at um, the YouTubes, they're looking at things, all it takes is half an hour. They know it all. You know, I can observe my son, you know. He said, Dad, I know. His cliche is, Dad, I know. I know already. That's what he says. How are you doing in school? Good. How much you learn? Stuff. <laughs> this is the, the, the end of conversation. So I would like to more. And uh, spread out. The, uh, as, and also I learned something very, I think very important for me. Well, I, I worked in Hong Kong too, at Hong Kong University, uh, one month a year because we, are, we finish the exams here in October. And I had October, November, December, and Jan, three months I had kind of open to do research. So I went to Hong Kong to teach there and do research there. And I see this big building in Hong Kong and ask my colleagues, why do you have the names of these people on the building? Are, this, are they the owners? Well, some of them are contributors to the building. And, and we, and they, we may ask them, why are you doing that? Why you give money to, for this building, association, etc.? Is to, they rem remember me when I go. It's a, it's a kind of, ah, it's a monument to your life. Mm -hmm. Okay, so my money in my life is spread out the stuff that I, I, I enjoy and I love. And uh, I'm also one of my, the, my mental Michael Mead talks about mentoring. That mm -hmm. older guys over 50, 60, 70 uh, need to learn to be mentors to other young people. And usually it's the young man or woman chooses the mentor it's it's someone who's not your family who is experienced in life etc cetera, etc cetera. and someone will ask you can can i spend time with you and uh, sure enough now you can't they also you know the old man pedophiles you can't have a young man around because something is wrong going on so we have closing we are slowly closing closing our relationships our dialogue with people of course, we dialogue right now, you see, but that's not, mm -hmm. that's not people to people. You know? Yeah, no, I, I agree. And it's sort of what you yeah. said about, you know, the kindergartners in the nursing homes. It's yes. the intergenerational yes. connection. Yes, 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 yes. Mm -hmm. So one thing is left, I believe, in my building, my monument or the future is, okay, I, I wrote a book about my life. I, mm -hmm. So far, 500 pages of my journey in life and dedicate to my two sons because I said, uh, your mother spends most of the time with you, have, has a view of your, your father, but your father didn't show what, or didn't have time to show you, you his view. So I'm writing a book for you about my life. <laughs> and it's called Just Passing Through, the title of my book. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> So uh, my wife said, well, you got 500 pages. It's so, uh, I, I said, well, I know I just. I'm not in just, a hurry. I'm, just I'm not in a hurry. Through. And said, okay, then do write volume two. <laughs> I'm still here. <laughs> I'm still here. I'm still here. I mean, uh, Jung wrote 30 volumes. So mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm relaxed about that. Okay. But that, the principle of that is it's what can I leave in terms of a, mon a monument, a virtual mon whatever, to the next generation? And I'm sure like that historian who discovered the history of that killed Aborigine, there will be someone 
suddenly looking at my stuff somewhere and say, hey, or, or YouTube, this guy is interesting. Let, let me research the guy. Let me see what else he's doing, see? So there'll be someone in the next 20, 30, 40 years that, uh, that will benefit from that. And I, you know, I like that, I like that idea. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, so I am wondering, you know, as you've spread these things through Australia, through the world, hmm. what challenges have you run up against? Challenges. I mean, Challenges. Yeah. And I mean, that can be on so many different levels. I don't even know how you might answer it. What has been challenging to you in spreading this Gestalt work or doing this kind of work? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I, don't, I can only say one thing that I don't see challenges as problems. They are actually stimulations to my uh, energy. I imagined you uh, might enjoy them. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know why the word challenge now enter the vocabulary as problems, difficulties, hardships. Um, I believe that every challenge, like any, like my journey, uh, I, I, I used to go mountain climbing in Germany, you know, I love that mountain climbing. And there was a place called Dolomite, so between Germany and Italy, Dolomite, and that was a Gestalt, two week Gestalt group that I was invited to, to, to work with. And I, in time out and after the group, I went mountain climbing. And as one guy said to me, I said, well, what's the point of this mountain climb? You climb one, you know, there's another one. He said, ah, but you don't know what's on the next mountain. You may discover something, curiosity. All oh, right, so you get to this point, you have, you're done your climbing, but there's another climb to do, you see? And there's another challenge to do to that. And I like that, I like that. And that's what got me going more and more. And I discovered these mountains in Germany and Italy have little huts where you go for a few kilometers, you get into the hut overnight. They've got beer, got food, and all they got everything you need. And off you go again. And that to me was ideal. In Australia, unfortunately, we don't have that kind of service. New Zealand has a three day walk, which I hope to do. Mm -hmm. uh, that has these little cottages, you know, where you can rest and stuff. Uh, Australia, unfortunately, Australia has got Australia is too big and too much desert and too, I mean, you drive, we drive 100 kilometers north or west of Brisbane, it's, it's desert, it's nothing, just mm -hmm. kang kang kangaroos running around. So really, it's not an appealing thing that you have, like in the mount, great mountains of Bavaria, for example, where I spent four years as a young man, mm -hmm. well, kid. So that's, uh, that's what, so challenges for me are really um, not obstacles, mm -hmm. but um, ways of being more creative in problem solving or in solution mm -hmm. finding, uh, maybe sharing and discussing this with other who may have these solutions. Like my walk, my great walk across Spain to Compostela from France, 900 kilometers in 19, 2006 with, a, with only one friend of mine, Australian. We have no choice. We have to walk all the way because we are from Australia and I'm not gonna go there again and pay all this money. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Once you start. So we walk and they, they and there was, an, I think it's a good example as you mentioned that challenge. This is a challenge which has a spiritual, physical, mental mm -hmm. uh, requirement. Mm -hmm. Now. And if you don't do it, like a, a guy in a, in a church, a wonderful priest, we stayed there overnight. And he said, whatever you do, it's a long Camino. Whatever you do, finish it. You can finish this year, next year. The Spanish take it one week at a time. But please finish it for your own soul. Your soul requires this finishing. And Gestalt called completing the unfinished business. It's, it makes a lot of sense to me. So we did finish it. It was wonderful. It was the best thing I ever did in my life. Hmm. And that was a huge challenge, huge challenge. Mm -hmm. It's actually, I mean, I always come to the other side of the challenges hmm. or what are some of the satisfactions, but I think you got there ahead of me. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And it happens only after the end of that challenge. Mm -hmm. Now you may come to the challenge and give up, you may take time and take time and procrastinate. 
Or you may say, hey, I'm going to get an answer by taking that challenge and move on with the challenge and see what happened at the end. And at the end, you'll find out. There's, there's even a song that you walk and walk and at the end, you find out that you were always at home anyway. <laughs> Yeah, so, I was just thinking. There's so, also that that natural justice thing you were talking yeah. about. Is yes. it, it, it'll be there eventually, you know? Absolutely, eventually. Just don't don't be so impatient. Mm -hmm. yes, it sounds. Yeah. I'm getting a lot of sort of you know pilgrimage and journey mm -hmm. feelings mm -hmm. as you're talking. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. Again, it's part of that um, what um, programming I got from from the baby on. Mm -hmm. uh, we, first, we were escaping from the communist uh, destruction of Ukraine. Then we were living in, in a co community of many refugees, which mm -hmm. my grandmother, thank God, she was a teacher. Mm. And she collected about 50 kids in that uh, refugee camp, mostly Ukrainians, Polacks. And I used to sit with her and there were all these kids there. I would say, you see, the teacher? my grandmother <laughs> i'm so proud mm -hmm. and she was my mentor since i was growing up until venezuela she came to venezuela with us and stayed with me and stayed with my cousins who were born there and all that until she went back to germany her son was there and she died in germany and i was in canada already about 16 mm. year old and that was a big shock to uh, my mentor my great mentor from childhood mm. uh, died but well there you are you seem to have uh, kept up some of her traditions. Mm. And she did stimulate me with all kinds of uh, uh, challenges. She said, what about this? What can you do that? What's the matter mm -hmm. with you? You can. Yeah. You're not sick. You can go. You can go. go on. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm, you know, I'm in my excuse. I don't go to school because I don't feel too well. My stomach hurts. Your stomach is fine. Go. Come back. We'll talk a look. <laughs> so mm -hmm. that was a beautiful way of um, being, having a, that kind mother was uh, she did the work she did the uh, uh, when we were in venezuela uh, there were many immigrants coming from after the war a lot of men to work in venezuela so i remember she had a big big uh, desk big um, table where she she was a great cook ukrainian cooking european cooking and there were always five or six men sitting around eating every day and she would pay her and that's how we, we lived uh, by her being a chef, a cook in Venezuela until I became uh, 15. And uh, I remember in the high school, uh, there was a kind of revolution. Venezuela always had revolution, it still has, uh, where we began, I remember throwing uh, school furniture over the, over the balcony, you know, and then they called the police and I noticed the, the army came in and it was pretty, my mother said, no, 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 no. We got to get out of here. Not another war. And you're not going to mm. belong. You're not going to get it. You don't want to get into it. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, yeah. And at that time, we were ready to go to, to Canada. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> wow. So <laughs> this, this may be a small question compared yeah, to sure. some of the context of your life. Mm. Um, but I'm wondering you're obviously a very good storyteller so i'm wondering if you have any particular gestalt stories that stand out either as a student or a trainer or hmm. a, a well, client or a therapist or any particular story, moments that stayed with you that, hmm, never thought of it that way <laughs> story a gestalt story uh well i can tell you about my piece of work with um laura pearls it's a wonderful story. Uh, I was a student and she came for the weekend. We were 20 of us. And the, I think great, great year one, I think, was year. I was beginning. I was scared shitless, <laughs> really scared of all that stuff. Being sitting in front, really be revealing yourself in front of 20 of my colleagues. <laughs> so she sat there, beautiful, big eyes, I remember. And she said, pointed to someone across the room at me. I said, young man, come over, join me, sit with beside me. I said, me? And I was behind a, behind a, um, I think it was a um, couch, a couch was there. And my head was like that behind a couch observing. And I had a, a notebook 
I'm an academic. I write down everything she says. That kept me away from her. <laughs> she said, no, 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 leave your stuff. Come and sit with me. I said, okay, okay, okay. You know, and everybody's looking at me. And they, they, they all wanted to work with her. I said beside her, tell me where you come from. What are you, you told her about my story about, you know, my growing up in, in the wartime and all this stuff. And she, of course, come from Berlin where he, the Nazis came. I mean, she knows the whole story. She said, tell me, how did you grow up? I said, what do you mean? Well, go and make yourself as a baby in a fetal position. So I went on the floor and went in the fetal position. I said, okay, now grow, grow. I just stood up and started walking. I said, young man, you missed a stage in your life. You were in a great hurry, aren't you? Yes. Which stage? I said, the crawling stage. You missed the crawling stage. And I was, wow, yes, of course. I always know, go, go, go. <laughs> yeah, I missed the crawling. That was a powerful impact. And when she died, I wrote an article about my story with her. So I published somewhere. I don't know, maybe it's the English, British Journal, Gestalt, the British Gestalt Journal, I think. I'm not sure. Hmm. Yeah. So that's a wonderful story, very strong. Still strong mm -hmm. for me, yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. Hmm. Okay, well, one of my last questions is, mm -hmm. uh, do you feel like you're part of a Gestalt community? Does that mean anything to you? Or what they, I'm sorry, mean? repeat that, repeat that. A again. Gestalt community. Yeah. Do you feel like you're part of a Gestalt community? Uh, no, <laughs> not anymore. I have a sense of, uh, being there, but not there. Um, I think we had some very uh, important issues in Australia where several institutes closed down because of all kinds of critics and also because of unprofessional uh, registration. We, we were not registered with anybody. Now the current Gestalt Institute, which many of them are my ex-students, uh, run as a university. They're um, accredited by University of Queensland and they run master course and they have quite a few people doing master courses. My criticism of that, even though I supported that, is that uh, once you enter university, and I know because I was there for 20 years, you get into the curriculum requirement, you get into judgments by other uh, people about Gestalt, you get about paperwork, paperwork, and five, six thousand dollars a year to belong. Fee. And I said, uh, for me, I am a, I'm a free soul. Uh, even though I went through all those things, you know, the university, academia, and all that. But I'm in private practice. We have a Gestalt Art Therapy Center where we do Gestalt Art Therapy, and we're wonderful combining the two together. The only one in Australia. And we have people, we have re uh, residentials, uh, you know, and I include Gestalt practice. Uh, ideas and I practice and show them my practice to the people who want to learn about both art therapy and gestalt therapy. And now I kind of, I will also be started in started or co-edited, co not co-edited, co-formed the GANS, the Gestalt Australia New Zealand Association, where I produced quite a bit of material and helped to promote it to both New Zealand and in Australia. And then Gans went in, in, their, in their wisdom, <laughs> bad wisdom, joining PACFA. PACFA, and I also belong there, I, I, I know that story. PACFA is an association of associations. Sounds very good, but they begin to control, control what you do, where you do is worse than university because they are an association with, who have mandates and rules. So I said, I'm not joining, I'm getting out. I got out of guns, I got out, of, I closed my institute. Uh, that's not for me. Guess what? A few years later, now, the Gestalt community in, this, in Brisbane moved out of PACFA. They're out because they were <laughs> suppressed. So they're, they're free now, they're free now. And they're continuing. And I went a year before COVID, I went to their one of their seminars outside Brisbane where they about 50 people together. They, they asked me to tell about the story of Gestalt in, in Australia, uh, my contributions, etc. So I did communicate a lot of stuff, my stories. 
to them. And uh, I'm open to whatever they, I'm open to supervision. I can supervise people they wish, uh, whatever, the therapy. And, but no, I think, I think my theory, and I don't know if it's true, I would like to have some feedback from them, that they were kind of annoyed at me that I quit and I didn't pursue and I continue. So my time, my effort, my stopped. So how dare he? And of course, if people who run the Institute now are my ex-students, well, they, they become aggro, aggro at me. Hey, you're a bad teacher, you deserted us. <laughs> and maybe that's true, maybe that's true. Maybe I deserted them, but also I freed them in a sense and I am freeing them to do their thing, their growth and their teachings, whatever they want. The other thing I, I'm a little bit, um, the final part, I'm a little bit um, uh, concerned also uh, that the Kishtal community as a reading it and the world, they're back to the idea of dialogical uh, communication, dialogical whatever, which is fine, dialogue in uh, Greek is dialogos, two people talking. I mean, that's fine. But they, they considered Fritz Perls uh, a little bit aggressive and they eliminated their empty chair approach. There's only one guy in New York who's actually teaching the empty chair approach as a skill. And it's not a trick, no, whatever. it's a skill that we need to develop as therapists because we, when I talk to you, you talk to me as a therapist client, you are projecting stuff on me and I project stuff on you. And it's called transfer counting transference in psychoanalysis. So we're constantly projecting stuff and trying to resolve that projecting projection to get in some dialogue, clear dialogue, contact, I call it. Well, uh, if you put the person, and I do it all the time, you know, sooner or later, there's an issue with my mother. I hate her, blah, blah, blah put your mother right there and talk to her. And then, wow, things start happening. Now switch and be your mother and talk to your daughter and wow, all this stuff come out and clearing out. The other thing I'm very successful, I, I must boast, inner child work. There's no question that you can resolve and finish a lot of inner businesses that you're carrying from inner child. And I can even tell at what age you're having, it, eight or nine, for uh, for boys and nine or ten girls that they have a lot of imploded stuff that they carry for for love whatever for mother parents issues but you i will put that inner child on 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 the empty chair and i make a drawing i make a client draw because we do that in art therapy you draw the child and it's always beautiful little girl or little boy put it in that chair and you talk to them make a dialogue you have make a statement every time you make a question go across, be the child, keep the child painting on you and respond. And that dialogue opens up a whole kind of worms. It's incredible. And then people said to me, I had the inner child, I didn't pay attention to her. And I did now with this work, I did. I, I made a contract with her that I'm gonna, every day we're gonna meet and do things together. And so I feel, so, he called me a week later, so I feel so relieved, so good. You know what? She and I are writing poetry together. Wow, beautiful. I said, that's it. You're now connected before you were disconnected. And also my other theory is, my father maybe, is that the inner child is an energy field in you that if you don't pay attention to it, it'll make you, it gets you into trouble. Accidents, relationship issues, projecting your, your inner stuff on your partner, so you may go to go to therapy, you know, couple therapy, okay, fine. But it's not inside you. The inside has to come out and clean up. We know that. And then uh, make a contract with that inner child. Mm -hmm. I made a contract with my inner child that, that I found in my work that hated my father that was dead. I didn't even know the guy. But I, I hate towards him for abandoning me. And I worked it out with my, my teacher. I discovered that my mother told that my father was a saint. We pray to him every night before we'll go to bed, that he was a wonderful artist, a, a painter. He, I have a photographs of him in his studio in, in Ukraine. We pray to the guy as God. And the other part of me was unfinished. 
I had rage towards him for being abandoning me as a man in his son, you know, a huge rage. And that helped me to be really, really connected with my sons now. Tremendous big new connection, totally. So mm -hmm. that was quite, quite helpful. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I, I see that the Gestalt communities and those teachers I see, either they don't know how to do it, and I, I, you know, I can help them, or they feel that it's not necessary to do that sort of a tricky, tricky stuff, put someone on an empty chair and have da, 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 da. it doesn't make sense you know, to many people because they haven't done it themselves. In my training um, experience, in my training as a, in our institute, I required every student to have at least 10 sessions a year. We had three years, so 30 sessions of private personal therapy to, to really find out what's going on. Otherwise, you have, a, you have a master's degree, you're trained, go and promise all kinds of well, things. And then you're that 12 year old son of yours on the couch saying, yeah, 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 I know, I know. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> And that's okay. I see. I don't get mad at him. Say, come on, I'm yeah. your dad. You should listen. No, it's fine. You tell mm -hmm. me about your, about your, uh, your, uh, your stuff you're doing. Dressing military things on on a Roblox. He loves the Roblox, and it's interactive. You know Roblox? Mm -hmm. You heard of it? No, I have kids. Well, he <laughs> can actually. <laughs> of course you do. I forgot. <laughs> Sorry. How old are they? Uh, I have a four-year-old and an almost twelve-year-old. 12. So. Well, perfect. Roblox, there it is. And he can dress the, uh, the Roblox and little things into um, military uniforms. And he designed the military uniform. It's a great stuff. He is interacting with the game. Mm -hmm. It's a marvelous thing. So, I mean, I'm learning too. Yeah. <laughs> Digital play yeah. therapy. Yeah, absolutely. Thing. Absolutely. Digital play therapy. That's what it is now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's all right. So it's more so, challenge for me. Mm -hmm. mm. That's true. So um, one of my last questions is really yeah. what's next for you and what do you think is next for Gestalt? I mean, you've mentioned right now a couple of things that it would be nice if it picked up again, mm -hmm. but do you think there's a new turn, a new direction? What do you see coming up? Well, uh, being where I am, there's nothing new ever. It's recycled. Okay. If you could look at all these things, whatever the, if you stay with psychotherapy, psychoanalysis, psycho, 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 psycho psychology, eventually given time and, and a couple of generations, the whole thing recycled again. It may be in a new, new form, new language, but it's recycled. So as I said, dialogue for me is nothing new. I did dialogue when I was doing social work 20 years ago, teaching dialogue, you know, in, called interviewing skills. It's called them. It's called interviewing skill. You sit there and you do a Rogerian stuff. You know, we, we, we played Rogers. Yes, mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm. tell me more. Mm -hmm. And that's the dialogue. And, we, uh, and now it's a dialogue, a relational dialogue. It's a new word, a new situation, nothing wrong with it. Um, that has been repeat itself. And my mentor, Michael Mead, said that traditionally in his view everything repeats itself every seven years every yeah hmm. my other oldest son just another little story my oldest son who was when he was about six my mother used to come uh, from canada she was about 80 come to canada for six months and she stayed around and we and uh, she didn't speak much english so we did ukrainian and my son said Dad, what can I say something to grandma in Ukrainian? Teach me. I said, uh, it's, it's a bad word. No, it's not. He said, oh, yeah? Grandma. He said, she, what? What? You can't say that. It's terrible. You should be punished. It's just a jokey thing. And you know what? This is my, my mother died at 103 two years ago. And uh, this is like 20, 30 years. He still remembers that word exactly. It's the only word he said, Dad, now that I have business in Ukraine, why didn't you teach me some Ukraine? <laughs> I said, that's okay. You invite me over. I'll be your translator. Pay me, go. Mm -hmm. I'll go. So we did. We Last year before COVID, he took me from, we were in Spain, took me to Ukraine, Lviv, where my father had this business. We went to the, where he, 
where he had his photographic studio. And guess what? On the same corner, same store, had a photographic studio. I said, wow, mm. look at that. So I come in and ask and say, look, my father owned this place. Oh, really? Yeah, he was a photographer. Oh, no, but we don't know. We don't remember. The war mm -hmm. destroyed everything. But I said, I'm glad that you still continue the tradition of photography in the same place where he did. <laughs> it was wonderful. It was really great. So we rediscover the old things again. Yes, yes. In exactly the same place. <laughs> exactly the same place we discovered. And my son, who was 40, uh, rediscovered Ukraine. I never asked him to go to mm -hmm. Ukraine. He just went there for business. Mm -hmm. He's doing solar panels in Ukraine. <laughs> He said, Dad, uh, maybe in five years, maybe I'll make 100000 a year. I go, what? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, my partner, he's got a partner there, and they're doing business together. And Ukraine is very open to business because they're now a little easier away from the Russians. So I know here you are, another, another generation is doing new things with something that I thought, well, it's nothing. It's... So I make, I may have been carrying a lot of uh, agro, toxicity, uh, experiences that were negative throughout life in, in Ukraine and then, uh, you know, in Germany and places. But um, watching him and the, those two, how they relate to the same thing is totally, totally different. Same thing, but different. It's incredible. It's incredible. Uh, so there you are. Wonderful. Well, <laughs> thank you. Is there anything that you would like to add to this conversation at this point? Well, uh, I, as, a, as a person who loves distributing as much as possible the words, and we are now in the world of words, on communication through words, basically, uh, we can shake hands, we cannot hug that much. <laughs> uh, that uh, I hope that this is what you're doing, and I really congratulate you. Uh, to spread us as much as possible. And, I, uh, and I'm hoping that Ukrainian will be the next interview in Ukrainian. And I'm available. If you find a Ukrainian in Mexico, I'm available. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, well, thank you. We'll be here then, okay? Well, I, hear, I hear you're